You're listening to The Peach Pit. I'm talking with Anthony and Tom from the Toronto band Denise. Their new debut EP comes out on August 11th, so make sure you check it out. And they also have a release party coming up on August 12th in Toronto at District 88. Anthony, Tom, thank you so much for taking time to talk to me and welcome to The Pit. Awesome. Thanks for having Thanks us. Thanks for having us, Derek. So as usual, I like to begin with everybody's superhero origin story. So take me back, if you will. Can you tell, let me know just how do you guys remember finding your passion for music growing up? In Tom's basement. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. His dad played in a bunch of like, well, in like a Polish thrash metal band and continued to play metal and other music in Tom's basement. So I remember the first time going there when I was 14, I was like, oh my God, this is the most set up I've ever seen someone's dad be to play music. And so then I I think I like, mm, I don't know, hobbled my way through like a Smells Like Teen Spirit cover and then attempted to keep up with Tom's dad playing like sick riffs. And then Tom was drumming. And I was like, these people are way better than me. Holy crap. But you were you were like playing quite a lot already still. Like you didn't you didn't get into guitar because of because of us by any means. Like you were already like you were into Dylan, I think, at that point, and you were playing a whole bunch of guitar and, and I think even trumpet oh, or something. I was playing trumpet too. That's yeah. that's true. Yeah, because we were in the high school we were in high school band together and we're like sharing records back and forth. Tom's taste was a lot better than mine in high school. Sure. Don't listen. <laughs> Uh, no that definitely helps right like like uh i, I mean it goes without saying that for me that was a, a big deal is having parents that were you know like not just into you know whatever their parents were into like my you know my parents were basically products of like you know like anthony said like you know the prog of the 70s and the thrash metal of the 80s and the grunge and like new wave of the 90s so you know, I got, I was blessed in that sense. Like my dad was feeding me metal and my mom was feeding me like Kate Bush and the Cocteau twins and then shit like that. So, um, you know, like any kid with kind of musical parents, like first I, you know, tried to play guitar, was absolute garbage at it, remained garbage at it. And then eventually made my way through a bunch of instruments until I was like, I could probably be a driven drummer maybe. Um, and then took it from there. Yeah. But yeah, we, we, we certainly, you know, played our fair share together in, in high school, mostly just jamming in, in said basement. Nothing more serious than that. But. I remember we had a 10 minute improv cover of the national anthem by Radiohead where I just played bass and it was just like this long, like meandering, like post rock cover of, of just the bass line and drums. <laughs> Sounds right. Yeah, that's kind of where things started. So how did you guys meet? Went to the same high school, but we were we were the only people at our high school from our respective schools. Like Tom didn't have anyone from his elementary school who fed to that high school. And I was in the same boat. So we were kind of both the weird outsiders at like this like Catholic French immersion school. Like we didn't know anybody going in. And so I think maybe we gravitated to each other for that reason. Yeah, you go in, you have no friends, and then you realize this other kid who also, well, we, we had some friends, but yeah. still, it's like you're, you're, you know, your, your social network isn't as, like, necessarily robust as you'd like it to be, you know, day one of high school, right, not, not kind of coming in with your established group of, of people, and so, you know, you look for folks, and then you find out you have some common musical interests, or even a musical interest. Yeah. And you're just like, cool, we're, we're hanging now, right? Like, that's all it takes in those days, too. Yeah. Right? You, just, you should need someone to listen to riffs together with. Basically. Yeah, exactly. What kind of riffs are we talking about? Like, what bands were you guys listening to back then? <laughs> okay, well, I, I, I remember, like, one of the first shows I ever went to was, like, My Chemical Romance. And The Bled were opening. And I remember being stoked about the bled opening and like a bunch of other kind of like hardcore and punk adjacent stuff. And Tom liked a lot of that too, but he was like, if you think this is weird, let me introduce you to the wonderful world of tool. And so he gave me tools, entire discography CD by CD in chronological order. And I, I ate that shit up. It was uh sorry. I don't know if I love swear on the show, but no, I absolutely. Ate those records up. They, uh, they blew my mind when I was 14. I was like, wow, music could be this weird and also emotional. Because I'd heard like horrible, I don't know, I don't want to say horrible, but I'd heard like dream theater and things. And I was like, 
this is not for me. I don't like Prague. And then I heard that band and was like, wow, this is something else. Yeah. But it's never as like as cut and dry as that, right? Like we were listening to our fair share of Prague for sure. Like, yeah. you know, there was Tool, there was Porcupine Tree, there Mastodon. was Mastodon, yeah. there was like the Mars Volta, like all of the kind of like vaguely alt rock and metal that was coming out of those like you know early to mid 2000s like the relapse records the hydra yeah. head stuff like the torch and etc and then you know you mentioned like like my comic you know it was also the time especially in like you know southern ontario of of like emo right like local and not local like listening to a ton of alexis on fire protest, protest the, the hero, hero. Yeah. Um, and then even like, you know, stuff from the States a little earlier than that, like the Blood Brothers and yeah. the number 12 looks like you and stuff a little bit more like Screamo and math rock and, and hardcore adjacent. Strange post hardcore. They're just yeah. like little like strange proggy post hardcore. Love all of that. Yeah. So when you guys met each other, you had already been playing music on your own separately for a while? I think so. Like you'd been t- playing drums and taking some lessons, I think. And I've been playing guitar for a number of years, but yeah, we've been learning, I think learning. essentially yeah. like there were, you know, again, we were what, like, I don't know, 14, 14. So there were no like real bands to speak of. Right. But we, you know, I was in a horrible, you know, cover band that lasted two months with some like mutual friends of ours. Yeah. And then I, I was in another kind of like more of more, longer term band with another friend of mine uh, in high school after that as well but yeah when we met we were just kind of still figuring figuring it out really yeah so at what point would you say that you guys started to kind of jam and get some some of your own ideas happening well we were in a we were in a pop punk band for like a few years before the pandemic called yano casino um, our bassist Brent Vipond was one of the two uh, lead singers in that band, and uh, I brought Tom on board because that band, like, they wrote some cool songs, but we just wanted to make things spicier and spicier. So I remember inviting Tom to come play drums, and that really clicked because I like to spice things up in the melody world, and Tom could do the same in rhythm world. And so we played in that band for a while, but I don't. I think that we wanted to do stranger and stranger things. So once that band sort of fizzled out and the pandemic relaxed enough that we could play music again, we started writing just whatever came to mind. We didn't really put any genre limits on it. And we started incorporating friends of ours who we knew uh, had musical talent, but hadn't necessarily played in bands before. So Raymond, like our, one of the uh, co-songwriters and lead guitarists in our band had never played in like a rock band before. And they're like a co-lead person with me and um our keys and like one of our co-vocalists lauren she'd only done musical theater before but we had her in and then eventually that coalesced into where we are now or yeah yeah it's interesting like we've known each other for quite some time and have certainly jammed a bunch and and you know we were in that band together as, as anthony mentioned but really like the past i don't know maybe two and a half years is yeah. is definitely like the most concentrated amount of time we've spent together writing songs and probably even in some respects, like the first real concentrated amount yeah. of time that we've spent writing songs together. Cause yeah. again, like, you know, uh, other than the occasional, like, you know, uh, uh, post rock prog kind of freak out in, in my parents' basement back in the teen days, there was a, a pretty sizable period of time, I think, in our like early twenties where we were not playing music together. No, you were in another band. I was in another band. Yeah, um, and then you know, I moved uh, uh, away, honestly, for like a, a year and a bit, and then I came back. We reconnected, and, and yeah, as Anthony said, it was like, "Do you want to play drums in this band?" And that kind of snowballed into us being like, "Well, maybe we should actually should write our own tunes." Write our own yeah. tunes finally yeah. after years and years of yeah. talking about. Yeah. but i don't i don't think things really took off what like we were we would write and meander and we would try it a couple times a week but i think what really coalesced it was having raymond in the room and everything going through ray and being like do you like this does this work and having that third person and that really owned in and like brought in the like the rooms in the house started to become clear once we had that third person and we could write tracks together yeah I, yeah sorry go 
yeah, it's like it's a it's a band, right? It's not like a solo project, one person singular vision. When I listen through the EP, it sounds like multiple people have had their ideas fleshed out into something that kind of comes together, which is really really cool. But people must ask you sometimes describe your music what do you sound like so what do you tell them i say uh heavy rock or weird <laughs> metal depending on who i'm talking to That's, those are the those are the things i guess yeah I, I i keep it pretty much as simple as that like yeah. uh, i tend to say rock music and if you know they start to get quite interested in it and I can tell that maybe their rock music is a little bit more or their, their conception of rock music is like a little bit more um, contained then I maybe start <laughs> throwing a couple of extra adjectives in there to kind of warn them that like they're not getting you know like a, a tragically hip kind of sounding like no. band, right like there's you know a ton of distortion in some of the tracks and screaming and etc cetera, etc cetera. Um, but I think like I, I kind of prefer to put it that way because to your point like there's a ballad on there, right? And, you know, there's there's piano on there and there's, you know, flamenco inspired parts. Yeah, and castanets. Castanets <laughs> yeah. and stuff yeah. like that. So even metal is like occasionally feels a little bit um, of, a, of a misnomer just because yeah. like, you know, again, if you're not down for the occasional kind of like, you know, tear jerker or whatever, then, yeah. you know, then you might not just be down. And that goes with the territory in metal, right? Like you, you, so often we shy away from actually putting emotion into our music and just want to put on those moments where we can show off, right? Yeah. And and play a bunch of notes and try to be faster and try to be heavier. What I really love about you guys is like you've taken the idea of progressive and mixed it with what I would call experimental. And you've gone into putting effort into the music so that it actually goes outside of the boundaries of what metal usually is able to capture uh if there was two bands just two that got together and made denise what were those two bands that's a tough one it's a tough one it's a tough one um can, can i make a pitch for one yeah so yeah, so you pick one yeah well <laughs> So I, I, and I think like I, I'm a massive fan of this band and I, I'm sure other members of the band are too, but I, I think really they've been quite inspiring to you recently. And even though I don't necessarily think of them a lot when I'm like writing, um, I do think that like there's, and there's a lot of differences too, but I'd say Swans is one. Like, yeah. um, and it's just that idea of like being able to access like really noisy parts, being able to, you know, do really long extended kind of more, you know, abstract sections, but also then, you know, having records that are basically, you know, folk records for lack of a better other description, right? Um, and, you know, I know that kind of approach of like trying to write a folk tune that's heavy or trying to write a heavy tune that's, you know, kind of like lilting, like that's, you know, I think something that you're quite good at is like oh, doing both of those things. Right? Yeah, and I would I would say I know this is maybe a weird pull, but I would have to say the band Ott from Montreal, just the way that they're a post punk band and the way that they're able to kind of to repeat the same phrase multiple times and give it new meaning through repetition. Uh, Swans is good at that too, but the idea that Ott could do that in like three or four minutes and take you on this journey with very few words and with just developing four chords in different ways. And those four chords make up the verse and the chorus and the pre-chorus and the bridge and the outro. It's just how far can you go with a few tools? And I think Ott um, really blew my mind when I was younger. And uh, yeah, they, they, they feel pretty influential on all that stuff too. I, th I think that's a good one too, because like, uh and may maybe this doesn't track for people who listen to like you know straight up pop music as their kind of like you know most listened to genre but I think because we have a tendency due to our sort of like shared musical history to you know sometimes start songs in a way that's like convoluted or come in with a riff that's in some odd you know, time signature or have some kind of wacky conceptual thought behind, you know, uh, behind, uh, you know, a, an, an instrumental piece. Actually, I think a whole ton of the writing process of late is kind of being like, 
okay, like, let the kernel of weirdness exist, but, like, how do we still make it kind of a pop tune? How do you justify the weirdness through the song? Yeah, exactly. How do we make it so the song can be, like, four or five minutes and not exist without the weird thing? Yeah, and, and Odd is a great example like there's tons of weird textures there yeah. there's tons of songs that like you said are just one part repeated over and over again um there's t tons of wacky stuff that happens in, in in that band's music but but it's like not their tunes still they're hummable most of them like they have big choruses yeah like yeah what did what did you hear when you heard the record what two would you pick if i can ask her if uh, if I had to narrow it down to just two, it, it would be tough. Uh, I definitely would throw in some sort of heavier band. Like it, it, it might sound bizarre, but like I, I kind of want to pick like a black metal band or something like that. That just kind of has a more uh, accessible side to them. But I can't think. So I'm just going to say Bathory for lack of actually sure. having a really. So that's kind of out there, kind of bizarre but then you kind of mix this with like i'm trying to find the right words for it there isn't really a band yeah yeah yes you you mentioned tragically hip earlier and i thought that was an interesting thing because like with the vocals you've given it so much room whereas usually the vocalist is trying to fight over top of the rhythm guitar or the drums or something like that you allow the songs to actually develop almost like grunge or something like that. And that's oh. what I love about it is when I first listened to you guys, I was just immediately thought these guys are experimental and that's so refreshing because so few bands, especially early on in being a band, they don't want to be experimental. They kind of want to fit into the mold. And mm. uh, so for a debut release being that original sounding, I just, I had to talk to you. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks. Thank you. We, we really liked making it. Yeah, it was a lot of fun. I think if there was a black metal band that we would all agree is an influence, it's got to be Liturgy, though. Yeah. I think yeah. That, would be, that would be the one. Um, I love everything that uh, she's done at this point. Yeah. She, uh, she well, doesn't... Black metal has an accessible, like... <laughs> When I think about black metal, often I'm thinking about atmosphere and feeling and mood and emotion. And that's not something you usually talk about when you talk about metal. And so that's yeah. where I see this black metal thing coming in. It's like, you guys do have that influence, but I would never call you a black metal band. And we've talked about this before, but like I, I've been pitching this idea as just like a general band idea for, yeah. for ages and ages. And actually like there's tons of people who have done a version of this and, and I don't I don't remember the guy's name right now, but there's a Ukrainian guy who put out uh, a record called Pale Swordsman, I think a couple of years ago now that just absolutely blew me away. And basically, like I've just been trying to start a band for for forever with the premise of basically being like Imagine if you like got the Beatles in a room and like forced them to write black metal tunes. <laughs> yeah. but, like, no double bass, no blast beats, no screaming, just kind of like giving them the general vibe of, like, yeah. of black metal and being like, but you know, you still have your Hoffner bass and it's still kind of thumpy and stuff like that. Barely right? any distortion. Yeah, no distortion. Yeah, exactly. Just like, you know, the the atmosphere and the, and the, and the vibe of it, right? Yeah. Um, and I think that, yeah, in some ways that probably that general idea like seeps in there a little bit where it's like it, maybe it's not tremolo picked maybe you know no right. one's reaching over it but but there's definitely that kind of uh, uh like uh i don't know textural or atmospheric element i, I would i would even uh throw in the word vulnerable like you guys made yourselves vulnerable thanks yeah <laughs> i, I do not i was like we shouldn't hide too old Played, played in too many other bands. I don't want to hide. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, it's play spent too out. much. Yeah, spent too much time writing music that maybe didn't feel vulnerable. You yeah. know, and that's like being vulnerable can be taxing, but not being vulnerable through like your creative endeavor also comes with its own kind of like uh, you know uh, uh, weight, right? Like the weight of I don't know, maybe like monotony or not feeling like you're getting you know, the release or... Yeah. You know. Every yeah. time I play those songs, I feel ca like catharsis. And I think that's that's the thing. I would rather have catharsis than be cool. <laughs> that's true. That's, that's true. a good quote. 
Uh, but the name, Denise, this oh. is odd. Uh, how how did you settle on this name? What what is it about that <laughs> spoke to you? Like, it's bizarre for a metal band, especially. I think that's why. I think that's why we picked it. I think I think we were. I, I think I was I was really sure that it was like I, I think it's one word. I want to be a one a, a one word band, and I was looking into the in the thesaurus and I couldn't convince anyone. And I think we went down the road of okay, what about names and what about kind of archaic, uh, mainly women's names that that didn't feel very femme that felt a bit butch femme, maybe a bit more mask than. Uh, most like modern uh, women's names, yeah. and then we landed on that one. Yeah. There's a there's a couple other ideas that were like bouncing around, I think, but yeah. that one that one felt good. It felt like easy to remember. It felt like, um, yeah, I don't know. Like also, it, it just like you you want a name that like I think you know um, isn't too self serious, but it's certainly not like. You know, I don't know if like if we're not necessarily a fun and jokey band. At least not like the music doesn't come across that way. So you know, you don't want like yeah. something um, too flippant either, right? So that seemed like a good balance between like you know uh, between something that like evokes feeling, but also isn't you know necessarily the doom and gloom kind of. Yeah, I didn't want it to be like come and have a bad time. It's yeah. like no, come to a bunch of people like singing their hearts out and have a really good time and like feel some stuff. Right. Yeah. Vulnerability. You said that. <laughs> yeah. I, yeah, I did. How, how did you approach the lyrics? Oh Lord. Yeah. That, that's, that's on you. <laughs> oh no. Um, you. I think some of the tracks are like fairly immediate and like about uh, people and events that are like pretty close to me and then there's ones that go really far back like flat the opening track I was trying to remember some of my like earliest memories and feeling like very othered and very much like an outsider as like a young kid um, and not and not fitting in and have and there's a lot of lines in that opening one it's like uh the jokes taped to my back and like that there's always like a like a joke on you and that everyone else isn't on it except for you and like i just remember that vague feeling of being like six and not not feeling very good or cool and i was like no i'm gonna gonna write a song that like ends very triumphantly about that and that it's cool you don't have to repent for that you're good the way you are <laughs> yeah we should say too there is there is one track um the lyrics to which were written by by Ray. By Ray, yeah. Um, so can't speak too in depth, uh, I suppose, about that one. Yeah, the fourth one about a man Ray wrote, and I know that that's from their own personal experience as well. But I think, I think the lyrics kind of exist separately to the music. I think we Ray and I both write, and now Tom too. We write like poetry in our off time, and then when we have some music put together, we go, oh, maybe that one piece fits with it. And then we try and put those things together and, and sometimes it works. Yeah. We tend not to be too hypercritical too of the lyrical. No, oh, yeah. Like, I, I mean, I've, you know, you tend to get in the mode of writing tunes where like you do want to pour over everything with a fine tooth comb. And certainly we do do that occasionally, yeah. like on the musical side, probably more than occasionally, probably more yeah. often than not, we're like stressing over you know, every bar kind of thing and, you know, what every person is doing in every bar kind of thing. But with lyrics, like, I, you know, I think I, I read through some stuff, you know, especially before we were tracking this, just to kind of be like, to, you know, is there anything that's coming to mind that maybe could convey this message a little better or even just like make it easier phonetically to, to sing, but still right. put, put, the, put the same thing across. Yeah. And, and honestly, I just kind of like, I, I read through a bunch of them and I was just like pens down, so to speak. Right. I was like, they are what they are. They do what they are supposed to do beautifully. Um, and so, you know, to your point, like it was a, probably a very different experience than the musical one, which was, you know, a little bit more involved and a lot of cutting. Yeah. And, you know. yeah. 
I think when they land, they kind of exist as complete poems before we add them to the song, and then we just try and make them fit. What about the name for the EP, Guilt of Canada? I thought that was a really uh, attention-grabbing name for me. I mean, a lot of people might not think so, but Canada has a lot to feel guilty for. And so how did, what made you choose that name for the title? Well, uh, we, I think when we named it, we knew that we would get that question. And we put it in quotes for the reason that it is about all of the guilt and about all of Canada and all of the people in it. When you look at the record cover, there's this dilapidated house slowly sliding down the hill. And I think it's about historical guilt and also all of the guilt. <laughs> yeah, just the collective personal guilt amassed to Ray. Right? Yeah, yeah. I think that's really important for sure. It's like, you know, uh, there's certainly, I don't know that we would necessarily shy away from a conversation about the political elements of, of what that, um, of what that title means. And I, I think it's obvious to most people who live in this country or know anything about the history of this country that, yeah. that to your point, you know, there's a lot of probably a, a, you know, a lot of guilt. Um, but, you know, I think, I don't know that that was necessarily our primary motivation for naming it that way. It was immediately apparent to us that that was a component of it, but yeah. the, the kind of individual guilt of, of the collective was also like very much a, a, an immediate um, sort of important component to the name as well. Like it, it was always from the get go also just about like pers the personal guilt of Everybody. Yeah, a yeah. collective guilt and a collective responsibility to make things better. Yeah, yeah. and imagine a better a better spot. One of Ray's uh, Ray's final lyrics on about a man is, "I will forgive myself for the wrong I've done," and that works in the context of the song. But I also think that that's where the record goes eventually. Is you can only take responsibility if you forgive yourself, but that's the personal kind of guilt, and you can only fix things if you confront your own guilt. I like that. It's a lot to a lot of food for thought to digest in there. <laughs> the artwork I wanted to talk about a bit about how you chose this picture of this house. What was it about the artwork that spoke to you guys? I I was the one that brought it in, um, but uh, I'll say what it is first, and Tom can talk about the reaction. Uh, it was taken in rural Newfoundland in a town of about 40 people where there used to be 400 to 1,000 and the government and financial situations and restrictions have slowly eaten away at the town to the point where it's, it's barely in existence anymore and there's that house literally sliding off the hill. It was a photo taken by um, uh, the photographer Paula Rizuri and then I brought it in and showed it to them among a few others but I kind of always knew people might connect with that one. What did you think? Yeah, it was, it, I think it was a pretty instantaneous reaction. Um, I'm generally a fan of photography as like album covers. I mean, I'm sure, you know, at some point, I'm sure we all had our own ideas about how it would um, sort of play out, whether it would be a kind of piece of visual art, like, you know, you know, uh, a painting or whatever, or, 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 or photography, but I don't know, this just, it, it worked with my sensibilities. And, and, and I also think that, um, you know, to, to sort of what you said about, about um, the lyrics, you know, part of it is, part of, part of I think what the tunes are about is, is that sense of like uh, personal um, struggle to kind of feel absolved uh, of, you know, one's, not even wrongdoing so much as like shortcomings or perceived mm -hmm. shortcomings, like per, like, you know, self-perceived shortcomings um, and kind of coming to a, a place of maybe like uh, understanding. Um, and, you know, with that, I think, uh, and this maybe sounds like a bit of a tangent, but um, there's a, and maybe, and maybe this is just me too, but there's a kind of bit of a theme of like domesticity um, to some of the tunes as well to me, like just the idea, of, and, and I think part of it has to do with where we are in our lives, but, yeah. um, you know, 
we're at, I think kind of at a crucial stage where like, you know, if you're not careful, you can spend a lot of time by yourself at home doing the same thing day in and day out. And if you're not happy with the kind of person you are and the kinds of things you're doing in your life, you might slide off it the hill. It becomes apparent really quickly, <laughs> right? Because you get into routine and your life starts to kind of, you know, crystallize in some ways. And they might not be ways that are uh, especially um, uh, attractive to you, right? Or the way you might have envisioned it. And it's just like an opportunity for self reflection. And so I don't know, that was one of the reasons that why I really like the artwork is just this idea of like, you know, the, the slippery slope of like personal complacency, I guess, you know, I mean, that's good. It is. I, yeah. Yeah. You got to stop yourself before the, your house falls down the hill. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Like do the work kind of thing. Right. What advice would you give to an aspiring musician? Oh, geez. Just, uh, play what gets you stoked and don't, don't worry about sounding like anything else. If you like a weird riff and it happens to be in seven, eight, just keep playing it. Eventually you'll, you'll be able to play it fine. And so will your friends. Um, yeah, just play what really gets you excited and don't worry about being cool. Being cool is not cool. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Mine is maybe slightly less like uh, inspiring or motivational than that. Oh but, dear. <laughs> uh, no, no, no. It's good. It's really good advice. Um, I, you know, I, I've I've heard a lot of people say that like they can't listen to music when they're creating, or they don't listen to music when they're creating because they find Whoa. it like distracting. Um, I get that. If if you've come to the conclusion that that's you, then like that's awesome, and you know, ride that wave. But personally, my advice is if you're unsure, like to go down the other yeah. deep end. Go down the rabbit to hole. As much shit as you possibly can. Yeah. Sometimes it can be really frustrating because you get in places where like you write a riff and all of a sudden instead of when you're ignorant, you maybe have one other reference point for that riff, but you're like, oh, it sounds sufficiently different from Coldplay that I'm okay. Right? <laughs> but when your reference points are like 10 billion, you can doubt yourself. But I think the relative benefits of just being constantly inspired by the crazy stuff that people yeah. are doing in like every genre, every corner of the world, it just totally outweighs the cons. Like it's life affirming. It gives you ideas all of the time. That's the juice. That's the juice for sure. Yeah. And it's just like, go and like raid your local shop for anything and everything, you know? Yeah. Yeah. You know? Is there anyone that you'd like to give a shout out to? Uh, I'd like to give a shout out to uh, our engineer, Jesse Turnbull, who made this record with us. And I really, I really, really mean that. Um, he listened to these songs and we thought we knew what they sounded like because we had some pretty good, pretty decent demos and he brought them into a whole other thing. He understood them immediately and he helped us make them as big as they could be and make and made us realize that maybe everybody should just sing all the time <laughs> maybe maybe there should just be four vocalists and uh that's like a thing that we do now and it's because of him and our mastering engineer dan weston did a phenomenal job just making those songs sound absolutely huge too yeah definitely a big shout out to jesse i think uh, part of what makes the music the way it is is because we overthink a lot of things and get to a cooler <laughs> place than we would if we under, you know, the, the under thunk thumb. Under uh, <laughs> yeah. but, but he was really good at when we would get down a rabbit hole and just pull us right out of it and say, like, what the hell are you guys doing? It's, it's a rock chorus. Just rock, sing loud. Yeah, don't worry just, about the riff. You know, yeah. It's, it's like, it's like what, what if this chorus tone sounds a little too much like the chorus tone in the other tune? It's like, well, are you the same band? Like, <laughs> tones are allowed yeah, to be exactly. the same. You're allowed to yeah. use the same tone more than once. Yeah, exactly. Oh, okay. Like, not every bar needs to sound sonically different from the bar before it, right? Yeah. He's, um, a, he's, uh, he's a genius. He yeah. did a great job on that Dear God record and a number of other things. He's uh, he really blew our minds. Yeah. Yeah. It goes without saying to the other band members, obviously, who, who couldn't. Yeah. Uh, with us Ren Nash on keys and vocals, Brent Vipon bass and vocals, and Raymond Thang, my co uh, songwriter, uh, playing lead guitar and also doing vocals. <laughs>
And on the new track, Tom does vocals. <laughs> Everybody's singing. Everybody's singing all the time. So awesome. True. You've been listening to The Peach Pit. I've been here talking with Anthony and Tom from the Toronto band Denise. Their debut EP, Guilt of Canada, comes out on August 11th. Make sure you check it out. And on August 12th, they'll be doing their release party in Toronto at District 88. Anthony, Tom, thank you so much for taking time to talk to me and take care of yourselves. Thanks, Derek. Thanks, Derek. Thanks, Tom.